Welcome back to the Deep Dive. You know we love to cover cutting-edge quantum computing research, and that's exactly what we're diving into today. We've had tons of requests to break down this new paper on quantum error correction, and I think it's safe to say it's a pretty big deal. We're talking about unlocking a whole new era of computing power. Absolutely. Imagine scientific discoveries we can't even fathom right now. <laughs> or entire industries transformed. I mean, those are some pretty high stakes. <laughs> but as our listeners know, quantum computers are still really prone to errors. That's where this research comes in, right? Yeah, it's called Quantum Error Correction Below the Surface Code Threshold. And catchy title. From Google Quantum AI and their collaborators. So can you set the stage for us? What's the core problem they're tackling? Well, at the heart of it is the fragility of quantum information. The basic unit of information in a quantum computer equipment is incredibly sensitive. I like to think of it like a delicate butterfly. The slightest disturbance can disrupt its state and introduce errors. Okay, so one little breeze in our quantum butterfly is all messed up. Exactly. And right now, those error rates are just way too high for a lot of the practical applications we dream of. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. So what's the solution? How do we protect our delicate butterfly? This is where quantum error correction comes in. It's like building a safety net. Instead of storing information on a single quibit, we spread it out across many. We do that using special encoding techniques. Got it. So it's like distributing the risk. Right. I've heard about something called the surface code. Is that what they used here? Yes. The surface code is a prominent example. It arranges the quibits in this grid-like pattern to protect the information. So even if one quibit gets hit with an error, the overall information isn't lost. Now, I do remember reading something about a threshold for this to work. Something about the error rates in the individual physical quibits needing to be below a certain level. You're exactly right. There's this critical threshold. If the physical error rates are above it, the error correction doesn't really work. And that's why this paper is so exciting, right? Because Google's team actually achieved below threshold performance. For the first time using the surface code, yes. Wow, that's huge. So how do they do it? What kind of setup were they working with? They used a superconducting processor with 105 quibits. And on that, they created what's called a distance seven surface code. Distance seven. What does that mean? This code distance tells us how spread out the information is. A larger distance means more resilience to errors. So going back to our butterfly analogy, it's like a bigger safety net with more knots to catch it. Exactly. I see, I see. Okay, so they spread the information out to make it more robust. But what kind of impact did that actually have on the error rate? The results were really impressive. They observed an error suppression factor of 2.14. Wow. That means that the logical error rate was reduced by more than half. Just by spreading the information out more. Just by increasing the code distance, yeah. That's incredible. And get this, their distant seven logical quibit actually lasted more than twice as long as their best individual physical quibit. So it's not just theory anymore. They've actually shown that error correction can make these systems much more reliable. Now, I can't imagine this was a simple experiment. What else did they have to do to make this happen? Well, they didn't just measure error rates passively. They actively introduced errors into the system. You mean they were deliberately trying to mess things up? In a controlled way, yes. Interesting. So they were poking holes in the safety net to see where it needed reinforcement. You could say that they wanted to see which parts of the system were most sensitive to errors. I'm sure they learned a lot about different types of errors along the way. Oh, absolutely. For example, they found that actively addressing leakage significantly improve performance. Leakage. Leakage is when a quibit jumps to an energy level outside the intended computational space. Ah, uh, so it's like our butterfly escaping the net altogether. That's a good way to put it. Okay, so they plug those leaks. What else? Well, they also demonstrated that their system could maintain consistent performance over several hours. Very important. If we want to run complex algorithms, 
we need the system to be stable for extended periods. It sounds like they're really making progress towards those practical applications we talked about earlier. They are, but as they pushed the limits, they did uncover something unexpected. Oh, what's that? A new type of error that occurs about once an hour. An hourly error. That's what they're calling it. So even with this incredible breakthrough, there are still mysteries in the quantum world. There always are. What did they find out about this new error? Well, that's what we'll delve into next. They observed these hourly errors as these sudden bursts of activity in their detectors. Like a cluster of around 30 qubits were all affected at once. It was short-lived, but still significant enough to really limit the overall performance. So it's like a rogue wave suddenly washes over a section of our carefully constructed safety net. That's a great analogy. So they know what it looks like, but do they have any idea what's causing it? That's the million dollar question, and unfortunately the paper doesn't give us a definitive answer. So, a quantum mystery. Yeah, it's a bit like finding a strange new species in the depths of the ocean, you know? We know it exists, we can observe its behavior, but we don't yet understand its origins or how to control it. So does this mean all that progress we talked about could be derailed? Is this hourly error a showstopper? It's definitely a challenge, but I wouldn't say it's a showstopper. Remember, this research is still very exploratory. Just identifying this new type of error is a crucial step. Okay, so back to the drawing board, but with a new puzzle to solve. Right, and they've actually already begun to probe the limits of their system even further. They're using something called repetition codes. Repetition codes? Yeah. Back up a bit for me. What are those and why are they useful here? Well, imagine making multiple copies of our butterfly wings. That's essentially what a repetition code does. It repeats the quantum information multiple times across different qubits. Okay, so it's like a simpler version of the safety net. Exactly. It's not as sophisticated as the surface code, but it's very effective for exploring these fundamental limits of error correction. Got it. So what did they learn by pushing these repetition codes to the limit? Well, they use their 72 qubit processor to run a distance 29 repetition code. Distance 29. Meaning they repeated the quantum information 29 times. Wow, that's a lot of repetition. It is. And it allowed them to achieve even lower error rates than they could with the surface code. So they managed to get even closer to that ideal, perfectly error-free quantum computation. You could say that. But did the hourly error show up here too? It did, unfortunately. Even with these ultra-low error rates, the hourly error was still there. So it seems to be a fundamental limitation at the moment, regardless of the error correction technique. That's what it seems like. But hey, at least they've identified it now, right? Yeah. And they can study it. Absolutely. That's a really important point. It's a testament to their scientific rigor that they not only achieved this breakthrough in error correction, but they also uncovered this new challenge. So where do we go from here? What are the next steps in tackling this hourly error? Well, I think the immediate focus will be on pinpointing the source of the error. Is it an environmental factor? Is it a problem with the hardware itself? Or maybe some unexpected interaction between the qubits? Once they figure out what's triggering these bursts of errors, they can start developing strategies to mitigate them. Exactly. It sounds like there's a lot of work ahead, but also a lot of potential for new discoveries. I agree. It's important to remember that we're still in the very early stages of quantum computing. Every challenge we overcome, like this hourly error, brings us closer to realizing the full potential of this technology. Well, this deep dive has certainly been a journey. We started with this exciting breakthrough in quantum error correction and ended up face to face with a new and mysterious challenge. It just goes to show you the quantum world is full of surprises. It's wild to think that even with such a major step forward, like getting below that threshold, they still found something new and unexpected, you know? Really yeah. shows how much we still don't know about this quantum world. What gets me is that by pushing these systems so hard to their limits, we're uncovering these deeper mysteries. It's like we're explorers in uncharted territory. Every time we think we've reached a peak, there's another valley or mountain range waiting to be discovered. Anything in this research that really caught your eye? Maybe something that wasn't widely talked about but hinted at future directions? You know. Hmm. Well, what I find really interesting is that this hourly error, it sets a hard limit on how well things work right now, despite all the other progress they've made. It makes you wonder, what if understanding and fixing this error was the key to even bigger leaps in performance? So instead of just being a pain, these quantum rogue waves, 
could be the secret to the next breakthrough. Exactly. What if by tackling this one specific error, they could reduce error rates not just by two times, but by a hundred or a thousand times? That's a possibility we need to look into. So it's not just about building better hardware. It's about understanding these errors at a deep level. Absolutely. And as this research shows, those two things go together. Building more complex systems helps us explore these errors in new ways, and the things we learn about those errors can then help us build even better systems. It's like this amazing cycle of discovery. Well, listeners, we've come a long way from talking about how fragile a single qubit is to the potential of having really reliable quantum computers. We've seen triumphs, and we've encountered some new mysteries. What's clear is that quantum computing is changing fast, it's full of surprises, and there's a lot more to come. It's been great exploring this groundbreaking research with you. If there's one thing to take away from all of this, it's that the search for practical quantum computers is a journey worth taking. With each challenge we overcome, with each mystery solved, we get closer to a future where the power of quantum technology can really change the world. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive. 